How's it going, guys? How's everyone doing today? Did you have a great time during this conference? I didn't hear you. Did you have a great time today and yesterday? Okay, so we're going to do something really quick. My friend Marcy is speaking in the track next door. I want to see if we can start a chant for her that she can actually hear. So we're going to start Marcy, 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 Marcy. Louder, let's go, let's go. Marcy, Marcy, Marcy. You can do better than that, guys. Let's go. Mar, keep it going. Uh, Marcy, 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 Marcy. All right. Good job. All right. Great job, guys. All right. So, my name is Jeff Wapley. Uh, I am the host of Angular Air. Who listens to Angular Air here? Oh, a couple people. OK. Um, you should listen to it. Everyone in this room. I am the CTO of a company called Get Human that helps people with customer service problems. If you ever have an issue with any company in the United States, go to gethuman.com, and we'll help you. So you don't have to deal with their customer service. You can just have us help you. I'm also a Google developer expert. And I am the co-creator of a library called Angular Universal that helps, if you have an Angular 2 app, render it on the server for SEO reasons and performance reasons. Today, I'm going to talk about Angular Universal. I'm going to talk about the new CLI integration for Angular Universal. And even more importantly, I want to talk about why the CLI represents an important underlying shift in the overall philosophy of Angular that I think is going to help us all, everybody in this room, build much better applications in the future. I want to thank two awesome developers who helped make this presentation possible. On the left, many of you know Patrick Stapleton. He is the co-creator of Angular Universal. He basically went to beast mode last month when RC5 came out, and it totally broke Universal. Uh, everything had to be changed. And even though it took us a year and a half to get to this point, Patrick basically rewrote everything from the ground up in two weeks. It was, uh, he's an amazing developer. Follow him on Twitter. Give him a hug. He's great. And on the right is Johannes Wiener, who has been a longtime Universal contributor. And he really took ownership over the CLI integration that I'm going to talk about today. But before I talk about all the great stuff that these guys have built, I want to take a step back. Let's go back in time a little bit to the good old days. Four years ago, when Angular 2, or Angular 1, rather, just hit the scene. You know, for me, and I think a lot of you out there maybe who started using Angular 1 at that time, you know, I was coming from a jQuery and backbone background. And Angular, at that time, you know, using something that in just one page with a couple lines of code to do something you know, uh, some things that were really powerful was a magical experience. The onboarding experience for Angular 1 was really great. It was, you were able to get up and running and build a simple application very fast. And that was a, a big part of the reason for the popularity of Angular 1. But there were issues when you started building larger apps and ran into some pitfalls and that type of thing. But still, it was a beautiful thing that you had just this one simple thing, right? And that was back in 2012. But you fast forward four years later to today, and we have all this other stuff, you know, which is great because you can do so much more with all this other tooling, with Universal, with Webpack, with Redux, everything else around in the ecosystem. It's awesome in one sense, but it's also not so awesome when it comes to starting to build something at first when you don't know all this. There's this big hurdle now, whereas Angular 1 just nailed it on getting people to be able to get in really quickly and easily without knowing much. A lot of the new, newer technologies, you have to get over this hump. And that's a problem, right? It's a problem with bringing new people on board on your team. It's a problem with getting people to agree to move to a new technology. And it's sort of this balance between power and simplicity. Everybody wants things simple. Everybody wants it to be easy. But they also want the features. They want to be able to do all this cool stuff. In an ideal world, you have both. You would have all the features. You'd have you know, all the power. But it would be simple. And that is the fundamental problem that the CLI is attempting to solve. So let's talk about Angular 2 and talk about 
how it came to be. I, I know that there have been plenty of talks about this, so I, I'm actually glad that I came last uh, in this conference because this sort of kind of, I think, ties together some of the stuff that you guys may have learned about throughout the conference. And this is, you know, from my, my viewpoint and how it ties in ultimately to the CLI. So Angular 2 came from a lot of different things. Obviously, first of all, from Angular 1. A lot of the core stuff that was part of Angular 1 is in Angular 2, just even better. So dependency injection, uh, change detection, the concept of this all-in-one framework. It's still there in Angular 2, just even better. But there's a lot more. So with Angular 2, a lot was brought in from the React world. Most notably, the DOM abstraction, which is a huge part of the reason why Angular Universal is able to exist. Angular 1 was tightly coupled to the DOM, and you couldn't do anything like this. But they built into the core of Angular 2 the ability to render to all these different environments, which allows for Angular Universal, which allows for something like Native Script or Ionic or anything else to easily hook in. And then, of course, Angular 2 itself has a ton of innovations, brand new stuff that's been introduced and then fed back into the ecosystem that a lot of other frameworks are, and other libraries are starting to use some of the new stuff that Angular 2 has sort of innovated and, and blazed a trail towards. But this is missing one other important thing from our good old friend, Ember. And it's maybe not uh, a framework that we all think about as much, but Ember nailed one thing. They did one thing really, really well. They have a strong set of conventions. The idea that you have these set of best practices, you have the, the, the right way of doing things, and everybody who's using Ember does it the same way. If you talk to Ember developers, they love the fact that if you go into any Ember project, they're gonna know how it's set up, they're gonna know how to use it, they can immediately get productive. And that's super important for, uh, from a business perspective, building applications. And this is a first uh, class citizen in the Ember world, and we want it to be a first class citizen in the Angular world. Of course, Ember didn't invent this convention over configuration. Um, a lot of it, uh, the ideas that they imp implement and think about came from the Rails world, Ruby on Rails. And the creator of Ruby on Rails, DHH, is famous for saying that your application is not a snowflake, meaning that you, know, you think that the things that you're building are unique and special, but there's so many things that we build in our applications that are not uh, the different than anything else, that we all are kind of solving the same problems. And if we can free ourselves from the deliberation of you know, naming conventions or file structure, and we just all agree on like, what's the best path, then it allows us to build these higher level abstractions, like all of these even better stuff on top of that. You know, Rails is a big example of that. But that's also why the CLI is important. Now before I get into that, I want to do a wave. So let, let's see if we can get this going. We're gonna start on this side, and you guys know how to do wave. You guys know football matches. We do that at baseball games all the time in the States. So when I say three, all right, starting over here with you guys, Okay, stand up, and then we're gonna go across, all right? One, two, three, go. Oh wow, you guys are good. That was really good. Oh wow, that was. With sound, with sound. That was, yeah, that was really good. So let's do it one more time, but this time, this time let's go beast mode, all right? And, th and this time, when you do it, I wanna hear cheering, all right? So you, you gotta not only wave, but you gotta, ah, all right? Okay, one, two, Three. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. Okay. All right, getting back to the CLI. All right, so I'm going to go over the different parts of the CLI. If you guys were in Steven's talk earlier, you saw something similar to this. Um, he talked about the current state of the CLI. I'm going to take it from a slightly different angle. I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state for those of you that missed his talk. But um, I'm mostly going to focus on things that are going to be coming, especially universal related. And um, just a warning that this is 
stuff that isn't in the current version. We have a PR for some stuff that is about to land. There's some stuff that's still under development, and I'll kind of talk about that as we go through it. Uh, so first of all, the scaffolding. I mean, this is the, th the first line that allows us to get past the issue that I talked about of uh, you know, simplicity and complexity, having a lot of power and features. By having scaffolding, we can very quickly, for first timers, bring up a new app and then run it. And for client side apps in Angular, that's there today. That, that if you download it, the Angular CLI, that works really well. It doesn't work as well for Universal today. You kind of have to patch it in yourself. But uh, once the PR that we submitted lands, you'll be able to just add the dash dash Universal flag, and then you'll have your Universal app fully up and running in like five seconds. So this is, this is actually alone a huge milestone for us. And Johannes is, uh, has major props for getting to this point. Uh, for analyzing your code, you know, doing static analysis code using Linter, using uh, Codalizer from Minko, basically it's you know, a set of conventions. It's taking the uh, conventions from our best practices guide and applying them. Uh, to find warnings, find things that might be wrong in your code. And we are going to be adding a set of universal linting rules, things like, for example, you know, a bit common problem that people run into with Angular Universal is referencing the DOM, referencing window dot or do document dot on their server side code. And there's no DOM objects on the server side. So we want to add this linting rule, so at least give you a warning so that you know to, um, there's some, a couple alternatives that you can do. So we'll have, you know, not only the warning, but some ideas of what you can do to fix that. For building your app, this is actually the exact same for both Universal and just client-side apps, but we are going to add in uh, this new thing called a Universal Pre-Renderer, and the idea here is that there's actually two modes for Angular Universal. There is pre-rendering and re-rendering, where pre-rendering is where you're just building a static website, so you're just generating a bunch of HTML files, whereas re-rendering, the normal operation, is where you actually have Angular uh, Universal running on your web server and generating on, on, at runtime uh, the web pages. So if you, uh, once this lands, if you do Universal pre-renderer and then do ng-build, it'll generate all of the HTML for your site. Uh, for testing, uh, right now it uses Karma and Protractor, but uh, because Angular Universal is on the server you, and you have a lot of services that are running just in the server, you don't necessarily need a browser. And the browser you know, creates resources and can be slower. So we're also going to add the testing ability to just do server-side only testing um, you know, without Karma and Protractor, just uh, either Jasmine or Mocha by itself. And then for docs, um, this is one thing that isn't, uh, isn't uh, amazing, like it, from the sense that uh, you know you might not think of it too much, but actually I think once this lands, a lot of you are going to be using it. It's to basically today you can use ng doc to look up information on different pieces. Like it looks up in Angular.io the documentation on different parts of, this, of the API. But with ng docs, this uh, the new thing that we're working on, um, myself and Wasim, who's here, is to do a document generator to basically create a microsite from all of your code, as well as you know, if you have markdown files with just documents. So basically, we're using this for the actual universal.angular.io, or we will be. And for your own code, you could use this to generate your internal documentation you know, at your company or wherever. Uh, for deployment, this is going to be really cool, but it's, it's a little bit further out. You know, it's still more something that's under discussion. But we want to be able to just do ng-deploy and just have that based off of the configuration file in your CLI config, deploy out to you know, a lot of the common uh, targets like either Heroku or AWS or Firebase or whatever. So obviously you can use like, the existing CLI, but the idea here is to try to create this generic abstraction on top of uh, each of those individual um, CLIs and APIs and have it so, so a simple way through the Angular CLI, you can switch between any of them. So that's something that uh, the team has been talking about and is a little bit further out, but um, will eventually be there. And then for migrating your code, so the idea here is that over time things are going to change, you know, in terms of standards, in terms of the APIs of um, Angular itself. And 
We want to build in the ability to easily change your code along with all those other standards. So that includes universal stuff, that includes you know, everything else. And this is actually what I'm, one of the things I'm most excited about with the CLI, because when you buy into the CLI, it means that you'll be able to adapt along with the rest of the community. It really solves you know, two major problems. It, it solves the problem of when the API itself changes and you, need, you want to quickly update it, but it also deals with, I think, what is really an elephant in the room. I mean, up until now, I have talked about these standards, the, the conventions that the CLI is based off of. But there's the, this assumption that goes along with it. The assumption is that those standards are the right ones, that the conventions are the best ones. But that isn't necessarily true, right? I mean, it takes time to hone in on what the best ways to do things are. And relatively speaking, Angular 2 is new. Angular 2 is just released. People are building stuff in production, but there, there needs to be time to let a lot of that bake and mature. So the expectation should be that over the course of the next year and moving forward, a lot of that stuff's gonna change. A lot of it will improve because people will figure out what the best ways to do things are. So when you think about what comes next, what are we doing? Obviously there's a lot of stuff being built, but I think what's important is that as a community, we gotta have to come together and really do uh, two important things. One is just to use the CLI. So even if it doesn't meet your use case exactly, even if it's missing certain things, it's a super important that as a community we all start to use it. And the reason is because that enables the ability for us to come together and more easily find these common set of best practices and standards. And it will actually help all of us move forward together. And the other thing is that when you run into issues, when you are using the CLI and it doesn't work, or you're using some other part of the Angular framework and it doesn't meet your needs, is to get feedback to us, to, to the people that are building Angular, to the people who, uh, or to do it yourself. So there are different ways to do that today. You're submitting a PR, entering an issue on GitHub, et cetera. But I wanted to add you know, one additional way because I know that sometimes it is, it's onerous to be able to do that. So I created the site, angularnation.org. And the idea is that any thoughts you have, any ideas you have on the state of Angular, on things that are working or not working in your environment, you don't have to even think it through. You could just brain dump and go here and just um, you know, dump your thoughts. And basically, we're going to have a system of curation that will ultimately turn that into either A, feeding back to the team to help push for certain changes, or just sharing certain information with the rest of the community through blog posts, through other mediums. So definitely go to angularnation.org and uh, check that out. That's it for me today. Oh. Ah, thank you very much, and have a great time, guys. Thanks for coming.